Welcome also from my side. It's a big pleasure to see such a big crowd here in the audience. I've never seen this room so full recently. It is my pleasure today to tell you a little bit about uh, planetary host stars and their output and evolution, which is crucial for the habitability of exoplanets for the Earth and for planets around other stars. Planets form in protoplanetary proto disks around young stars and the subject of my talk uh, is the stars. I will focus on that. Of course, uh, there are disks and interstellar media where stars are formed, but this will be the subject of Bruce Elmgren's talk uh, tomorrow. Originally, his talk was supposed to be before mine, but he couldn't make it uh, for today in the morning, so his talk was shifted to tomorrow. And Inga Kamp, right after me, will talk about the physical and chemical properties of uh, protoplanetary disks. Just to put my talk into context, I will focus on the star as soon as it has lost its disk already and is influencing the planets uh, around it. So when we talk about stars and, and want to look for planets around them, we mostly focus uh, for various reasons on only specific type of stars. We don't really take into account uh, o stars and A stars because they are too short for, for to develop any biology around them, so they don't have the long lives that uh, G and K stars have. Uh, F stars are more interesting already, but they still have a little bit too short lifetime maybe. G and K stars are within our focus and M stars as well, whereby with M stars we are focusing several challenges, which I will uh, go into more detail later on. So they have very slow evolution, stable habitable zones, but only uh, very late in their lifetime. So there are quite a few challenges, although M stars are very attractive these days. There are planet hunting missions like uh, TESS and also others who specifically look for uh, habit habitable planets around M stars, because there you can detect them much more quickly, much more easily. Uh, habitable zones are much closer in. So there are several pros, but we have to be skeptical and careful, and I will talk about that later. So, if we want to establish and sustain habitability around the planet, uh, many astrophysical factors need to be right. They need to be in, in good place, in good shape. I thank Manuel for this slide. I stole it from him, or he gave it to me. <laughs> Maybe we'll see it again. <laughs> Uh, so we uh, need to take care about the stellar radiation in different wavelength ranges, part particles and CME output of the star, winds and magnetic fields and planetary magnetospheres. And I will focus on some of these aspects uh, in the course of my talk. So the stellar environment that is shaped by the star itself is very important to consider also in an evolutionary uh, term of view. Uh, the activity output I mentioned already for stars is triggered by the stellar magnetic fields. So any kind of star we observe in the universe uh, does have magnetic fields. There is a tiny group that does not have that many, but recently also quiet A stars were discovered to have magnetic fields as well, different ones, but they have them. So we need to, need to take them into account to understand them, to understand what's going on inside the stars in terms of uh, stellar magnetism, uh, to be able un to understand their output. And in the different, within the different types of stars, we are focusing or we are uh, confronted with the globally strong and stable fields of AP and BP stars, but these are not in the center of our uh, attention. As I mentioned already, they are too shortly lived for uh, uh, likely too shortly lived for habitable planets around them. Uh, then totally different uh, um, effects on the surface of, of uh, um, stars we see for solar type, for uh, G and K stars, where you have locally strong and dynamic fields of, uh, which, are, which change a lot, which create a lot of output. I will mention, I will go into more detail on that later. And for M dwarfs, we again see a very different uh, M dwarfs as soon as they are really uh, late type, when they are uh, M5 and uh, later, they start to be fully convective and they again produce very different kinds of ma uh, stellar magnetism. So they again have very globally organized strong magnetic fields, which are less complex than the one of uh, solar type stars. But again, different from the hot uh, star fields of A and B stars. So magnetic fields are created within solar type stars, I'm focusing on that now, by the so-called alpha omega dynamo, that is an interaction of rotation and convection inside the star. Uh, and again, to show you, in, in cool stars, uh, we have a 
more or less big radiative core, a convective layer outside, and these two layers are rotating differentially. So the core is rotating more quickly uh, than the shell. And this interaction uh, uh, creates a so-called alpha-omega dynamo, where the magnetic field is uh, produced and trigger triggered and kept on. This will get important again later on when we talk about rotational evolution. This has a lot to do with uh, the structure inside the star. For K stars, the convective uh, envelopes are getting thicker and thicker until late type M stars, which uh, get fully convective from spectral type M5 on. Uh, to show you the other range of the HRD <laughs> on a sketch uh, for the Sun again, a radiative core and a convective layer that is getting thinner and thinner towards A stars. A convective core starts to evolve in the center of the star, which is again getting bigger, and the outer convective, very thin convective layer is getting smaller and smaller for B stars. We do observe magnetism for these stars as well, but it has very different uh, properties than uh, magnetic fields for uh, the Sun for solar type stars. Triggered by these magnetic fields are all kinds of t uh, activity signatures, uh, solar surface and spots. And if we get in, if you have a look into the interior of the sun, the radiative core uh, and the tachocline, the shear layer between the convective layer and the radiative core, you see that uh, flux tubes are created. And sometimes if the field gets strong enough, these flux tubes, flux tubes diffuse onto the surface. This is where the spots on the solar surface are, are created, the dark spots, as uh, the convective convection is stabilized here and the areas are getting cooler uh, in where the flux tubes are getting outside of the surface. And this is changing a lot with uh, solar activity levels. So if we have, if solar activity level is at maximum, we have more spots. And if it's at minimum, uh, the global field is getting uh, bigger, but the spots are getting uh, less. So that has a lot to do with the activity cycle of the sun. And the alpha omega dynamo driven by the tachocline is working inside to produce this uh, magnetic field. So as I mentioned already, differential rotation is an excellent mechanism uh, that is producing magnetic fields organized on large spatial scales. And the flow with chaotic tra trajectories, which is produced by turbulence, for example, that can act uh, at a small scale as well. And when rotation is present, a turbulent flow in a stratified environment uh, can produce a large magnetic field. So this, uh, this is what essentially is going on inside a solar type star or K stars. These magnetic fields produce flares, coronal mass ejections, high energy radiation in UV, EUV and in X-rays. They also produce stellar winds. And uh, what we can study and what we want to study by understanding magnetic fields and their output in more detail is radiation atmosphere interaction of the star and the planet, magnetosphere and wind interactions, and the whole magnetosphere atmosphere system in the long run. So uh, magnetic field evolution uh, and stellar evolution has a lot to do with uh, rotational uh, evolution and the according ev activity evolution in the lifetime of a star. If you have a look at this slide, uh, that's a sketch again solar type star, a very young star with a lot of spots all over the place. And as it's getting older, time is increasing, the spots are getting less and less, the star is getting less and less active and producing less and less activity output. Uh, a planet around such a star is evolving from the very beginning on together with the star. And as you can imagine, it's very important how a star, how the sun in the past looked like, uh, how the planet in the end could evolve and produce an atmosphere, get rid of an atmosphere and so on. This is something that will, address, will, will be addressed in future talks, in Manuel's for example, I think. Uh, but uh, the evolution of a star, that's the point I want to make now, is very important for the co-evolution of the planet around the star. And it, as it's changing a lot, we really need to take care of that and also get the history of the star if you want to know the history and the evolution of the planet around it. So if we are having a, lo a closer look at the rotational evolution of, of stars, of solar type stars, what you see here is plotted uh, Rossby numbers against uh, LXL bonds, so activity or values in, in X-ray uh, in relation to volumetric lumi luminosity. And you see that if you plot observed stars, uh, 
that at a certain uh, rotational level, fast rotating stars here, slow rotation here, you see uh, that the stars, the very quick rotators, they re reach a certain saturation level in X-rays and then as they age, as they rotate, start to rotate more slowly, also their X-ray activity uh, increases, which, which is as well, of course, very important for the planet surrounding, surrounding these stars. The Sun is uh, imprinted here. So not only rotation is decreasing, but also X-ray levels, which at the beginning are very high spots, are in high numbers. Also the X-ray levels are decreasing, which is of course important uh, for, this, for the planets around them. The same holds true for, for the large-scale magnetic flux. So also the large-scale magnetic flux of aging stars is correlating with the a rotation and shows a saturation in the beginning. So stars, when they rotate quicker and quicker, in the past or when they are younger, so to say, they don't necessarily increase the magnetic fields endlessly, like it is the case for X-rays, but there is a certain saturation level. And as they age at a certain point, uh, also the large-scale magnetic flux is going down, together with the age and the rotational evolution uh, of the star. So if you want to uh, attack that and address that in a, in a better statistical way, and that's, uh, that is work that was done by Colin Johnston in our group, um, we can plot, for example, stars uh, with different stellar masses and a rotational period plot in days here. And you see that uh, for specific masses and for specific uh, rotational periods for that age, which is very young, and then the distribution is getting older under quotation marks. You see that we have rotational periods all over the place. So initially, any star, any solar type star can have any kind of uh, rotational period. And as the stars age, they cluster together towards uh, uh, the shorter periods. Let me show you a short movie on that as well. So we are starting off with a stellar distribution where stars have the same age of 100 mega years. And as age is increasing, denoted in this number here, you see that the rotational periods also de decreases <laughs> towards a certain, uh, increases towards a certain value. And at, at, at some point, the stars all get together, more or less. And this already happened for our sun, by the way. So the sun has already, is rotating quite slowly already. It's quite an, it's a middle-aged star. And we cannot trace back how it, really rotated in the past, so if it was a fast or slow rotator, which would be very important for us and we try to find out more on it. But even for the Sun, we cannot really tell if it initially was a fast or slow rotator, which would be, of, of course, very interesting and important to us, because then we would know which systems do work, like the Earth and the Sun uh, could evolve together to a habitable planet, luckily, as we all know. So if we want again to put this into rotational evolutionary tracks, for example, we have the fast rotators on this track, again, age against uh, rotational period, uh, intermediate rotators in green and slow rotators in red. And if we analyze the rotational evolution or plot the rotational evolution uh, track against uh, the X-ray evolution of a star, we see that something I kind of mentioned already, that for the slow rotators, so the ones that started out with a very slow rotational period, the X-ray evolution is taking a very different path than the one for the fast rotators. So there's a big difference in activity output and X-rays and any other kind of, of likely also CMEs flares around uh, the fast rotators than it is around the slow ones. And the intermediate rotators here in green are somewhere uh, in between. So we are facing non-unique activity ages. And of course, I guess you can imagine that this makes a big difference for planets uh, around the different solar type stars. And what needs to be mentioned as well, exactly this period is the important period for a star planet uh, system to evolve into a habitable or non-habitable one as the formation of the planetary atmosphere is happening exactly in this period. Uh, crust plate te tectonics are coming in, oceans are evolving. So this is, it's really crucial uh, for a planet around a star uh, what happens during this time period. 
So we really want to find out more how these different factors are influencing planetary atmosphere evolution erosion in different ways. Uh, and we can also study how the different rotators erode atmospheres in a different way, but this will again be shown in Manuel's talk, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so I'm referring to his for tomorrow. And uh, I mentioned X-rays already, and we also need to talk about energy output in different wavelengths, of course. So we talked about rotational evolution. Stars are starting out with different rotational periods, getting older, heavy, having very different uh, scales of output depending on their initial rotation rate. And we can and need also to consider this output in the different uh, wave bands. Uh, I'm showing you here, for example, to really see how different it can be. Uh, pictures for the sun in the uh, optical wavelength range, the photosphere around 6000 K, uh, lower la layer, the phot uh, photospheric layer of the sun, then a little further above uh, where the atmosphere is getting heated up already by magnetic fields, magnetic reconnection processes we do not fully understand yet. So the chromosphere just above the photosphere uh, having already around uh, up to 10,000 K. The ultraviolet sun looks a lot different from the optical sun. We already see uh, plage areas, uh, spots. We see it in the optical as well, but these plage features and the magnetic field features we do not really see uh, in the optical sun. Then the transition, transition region in EUV, <coughs> where the, uh, um, the outer layers are heated up and up to 50,000 K already. You already see uh, flare signatures and, and uh, CMEs possibly that uh, uh, get out when flux tubes are opening. And then again, the EOV sun uh, heated up to 600,000 K uh, already, again a higher layer. You see a lot of activity output uh, as well and again. And the 2 million corona of the sun in X-rays where the same picture, the same stage is showing a lot more activity, a lot more radiation, uh, which the planet is facing as well, of course. And, and uh, as this, when the sun was younger, when solar type stars were younger, they show even much more of this energy output in X-rays, as I mentioned already. So if you really want to take, the, take into account the effect that a star the sun has on the planetary atmosphere, we also need to take into account uh, the, different, dif the different influence of the different wave bands uh, in the optical photosphere, active, inactive, UV and chromosphere. <coughs> and what a project that a master student of us uh, was uh, working on uh, is put together all the different signatures for a spectrum from, from a quiet area, from a spot area and from a plage area, for example. And for this work, we need uh, uh, filling factors of, of, the sim of the different components to denote them as a function of stellar activity level, like S index or LX to L ball. And what she did in the end was construct uh, spectra for the different contributions from the solar surface, from plage, facule, and hot facule areas, umbra, penumbra, and you see that uh, on this plot, wavelength against uh, irradiance, the different components of the, uh, of the different areas on the surface of the sun they have, or of, of solar type stars, uh, they have quite different uh, spectroscopic signat signatures, in, especially in that uh, wavelength range. Whereas in other ranges, they are quite similar. So we need to take into account the different uh, levels here. And what she also did was putting together synthetic XUV spectral irradiance from these solar components for uh, a set of um, uh, young solar type stars, Ikedra, Paivonuma, Beta Coma, and the Sun in this case. And uh, Ikedra is a very active star, the youngest star in the sample actually. And you see that uh, the irradiance for Ikedra is quite a, is significantly higher than for the Sun, for example. The Sun, denoted here in yellow, and then two other stars, Paivonuma and Peter Kome, who are slightly older than Ikedra. So you, you really can follow the age sequence in, in that uh, wavelength area in the spectrum as well. And you need to take it into account because different 
Uh, wavelength bands have different influences on uh, atmospheric signatures of planets, so they erode different layers of the planetary atmosphere, said in uh, simple terms, and cause different uh, chemical reactions in a planetary atmosphere. So what I did not mention yet in a little more detail, Oh. Our flares, super flares, and uh, coronal mass ejections. So, rotation is important, activity in different wavelength bands is important, and uh, flares, super flares, and anything need to be taken into account as well, as far as we can do that. For example, with the spectra I just showed you. Uh, but just to give you a little more details on flares, super flares and coronal mass ejection, what can be done, what cannot be done from the observational point of view. Um, uh, I will show you in the next few slides. So coronal mass ejections are triggered by magnetic reconnection processes. This is work that is uh, a lot done by Rachel Austin and uh, Shibata. And they they appear when during sudden releases of magnetic energy stored near sunspots. So you have flux tubes diffusing up to the surface. When they open up, CMEs can occur. And uh, super flares were already observed in other stars to have uh, 10 to the 33 or 39 erg, which is quite a bit more than the sun usually shows, shows in flare signatures. Uh, they seem to be less frequent than solar type stars, and, but the largest flares are a million times more energetic than the largest solar flares. The maximum energy is correlated with the rotational period, not surprising likely, and super flares seem to occur more frequently on faster rotating stars. It's not correlate, correlated, sorry. Uh, solar, solar flares are sometimes associated with CMEs and cause, can cause geomagnetic storms. And uh, we can study stellar flares in quite a bit of detail. They are observationally accessible in quite a good way. Uh, but CMEs are not. There have been quite a few attempts already to, to oops, uh, sorry, the wrong way, to uh, detect CMEs on other stars, but there was not any conclusive detection yet. Uh, just an another nice picture of uh, of a flare when you have a look when we have a look at the X-ray sun with the uh, Yoko instrument. You see that uh, the sun is flaring. You see again the nice flaring activity sig signatures on the surface of the sun. Um, discoveries of super flares were also done with uh, Kepler data. I just wanted to show you some current observational in investigation that is going on by colleagues from Japan where the, uh, in, in, uh, by analyzing a lot of Kepler light curves, high quality uh, space data, they discovered a lot, like more than 1,000 super flares of very high energies um, in around 300 solar type G stars, so G type main sequence stars, which is really a lot. And uh, they analyzed data of 30 minute minute cadence and, and uh, saw flare, flare signatures that are huge like this, for example. And the flare energy is the radiated energy in the white light range and cal calculated by assuming a 10,000 K black body radiation. But this is just to show you uh, other stars, G-type stars seem to flare a lot and a lot of them also seem to have a lot of uh, a very high frequency of super flares going on. And we, of course, ask ourselves as well, uh, how is the sun behaving in this respect? But for the sun, the likelihood seems to be very low that uh, super flares are occurring more, than, more often than one, in, one time in a thousand years. But of course, we cannot exclude that we will also face another super flare. I mentioned already, observing flares on stars is easy, and we want to do that because we want to get statistics. We want to find out how often flares are occurring on other stars to be able to study their influence on and model their influence on planetary atmospheres. Uh, they can be studied via coherent radio emission in in short in long wavelengths for the sun and for the and for stars. Uh, radio gyrosynchronous synchrotron radiation wavelengths can be studied, can also be done both for the sun and the stars, like optical UV continuum signatures for flares, optical emission lines, far UV emission lines, EUV soft X-ray and non-thermal hard ray X-ray emission. Can be done for the sun, had, could not have, wasn't done for stars yet or wasn't achieved yet. 
So that needs to be clarified. But for CMEs, it is a lot more difficult. So for the sun, we know there are CMEs, they affect us, they affect our atmosphere. But for stars, we don't know how they behave compar in comparison to the sun. It is likely that they are not so different. So Thomson scattering uh, measurements via coronagraphs is pos are possible for the sun, but not for stars. Type two bursts, which are a signature for uh, CMEs for the sun, can be done for the sun, but have not been detected yet for stars. There have been several attempts, but um, no detection so far. Non-thermal emission, scintillation of point radio sources, and so on. So a lot of detection methods that are possible and more or less easy for the sun uh, could, it, it was not possible yet to do it for stars. So we don't know how stars behave in terms of CMEs yet. An investigation I wanted to mention, also done by, by Rachel Austin and her collaborators, is a GVLA, a radio telescope, and upper simultaneous measurements of M dwarfs. And there they saw, they observed a lot of flaring and activity signatures, but uh, during their 20 hours observations and overlapping radio and optical data, uh, they still did not identify any type 2 burst. So even a very intense search for flares or for CMEs in connection to flares was not successful so far, but the work is continuing and it might also have something to do with the uh, type of the stars, like the SVs or M stars, which have quite uh, strong magnetic fields. So we, are, we were talking about output in different wavelengths, rotational evolution, flares, CMEs. Winds are important as well, of course, which are also launched by the magnetic field. We discussed in the very beginning. And I won't go into any detail here because uh, this will also be covered in another talk. Uh, but just to show you shortly how important the stellar wind that is launched by the magnetic field uh, also is and very likely is in terms of particle outflow and effects on the planetary atmosphere. Uh, here's a picture of the sun, of the solar wind signatures made by Ulysses, where observations were done during solar minimum and you have uh, outward and inward flows and you see that uh, in comparison to the solar maximum there is a lot uh, more ongoing, a lot more quite chaotic structure and a lot more wind uh, launched in any direction uh, around the sun. More details on that in another talk as I mentioned. So uh, if you want to stand, understand stellar activity uh, we need to understand the magnetic fields. I hope I made this point <laughs> already. And I wanted to, uh, of course, also tell you something on, on how to detect and how to analyze magnetic fields, because this is crucial if we want to get more understanding and study them in more detail. Uh, there is a technique, the so-called Seaman Doppler imaging, where um, based on big telescopes and spectropolarimeters, uh, we can observe a star having a magnetic field that is rotating. This is a schematic uh, drawing, of course. A star with a very strong dipolar field to make the signature stronger and, and easily visible, inclined by 45 degrees. Uh, we is an eye of 10 kilometers per second. And as you see, as the star is rotating, magnetic field lines are pointing outwards and inwards, north and south pole. Uh, these so-called Stokes parameters are changing a lot. We have the Stokes I parameter to the upper left, uh, V, Q and U on the bottom, and these are uh, parameters telling us how the magnetic field geometry is changing. So v is a measure for the circularly polarized light that is polarized by the magnetic field, and depending on the strength and the shape of the signature, we can get some information on the geometry of the field by inverting these line profiles into stellar images. So what we see from the star is only these profiles in the best case, but not uh, this picture. This is what we calculate via doing the uh, Doppler imaging uh, procedure. And this is how we can, from a very good observational set, we can, we can determine our magnetic field geometries. Uh, this is currently being done and was done by many people, by us as well. So Deshn is also working on that, uh, sitting here in the audience, for quite a number of stars. And the project we are currently working on is doing the mapping and then uh, field extrapolation and wind modeling, for example, of young solar type stars, Paivonuma here again, 
where you see uh, data and uh, Doppler imaging, magnetic Doppler imaging results from two different epochs. The star was observed in 2007 and in, in 2015. And uh, based on the Stokes parameter changes I was just showing you, we reconstructed the surface field geometry uh, in both uh, observational periods. And you see that uh, for 2007 we had a quite a simple uh, geometry. Uh, magnetic, negative magnetic field on, on the pole, some positive components here. And if we compare that to the result in 2015, you see that uh, a lot more complex patchy structure is going on uh, in that year. And for this star, we still need to find out if there is maybe a polarity switch going on, as Pesan is already also showing it, and other stars uh, are showing it. So that was observed and analyzed already. But for this star, we don't know yet. It's continued to be observed. And similar work is done for a set of other prototypical young solar type stars, Ikedra. We had it already before, having modeled uh, the uh, spectra in different, different wave band, bands, X-ray, EOV, H and PAG, Pi-1 UMA, Pi-1 REB set and Kappa-1 set, spanning uh, an age range from very young to older ones approaching the, uh, or being on the sums already, and also having ages already where life on Earth or life around such a star could have started already. So we try to cover a good age range of young solar type stars to be able to see how activity, how magnetic field, how all the other structures develop in order to be able to then do the uh, wind modeling around the stars. So the magnetic fields I've shown you uh, for Pagonuma and here in this case for Kappa One Seti, uh, they can be extrapolated and the winds, uh, based on a code we are using in collaboration with uh, people from NASA, uh, the wind modeling can be done and we can then study in more detail how the wind affects uh, the planetary atmospheric erosion. This is important to be able to do because stellar winds cannot be uh, detected directly. So we need to somehow model them and try to get us well, as, as well determined conditions as possible around young solar type stars, for example, to get a clue on how the Earth or what conditions the Earth was facing in the past. So this mapping work is done by quite a few people meanwhile, and there have been several observational sets together, statistics were, were uh, done and put together. And let me show you a plot that, is, that stores a lot of information. <laughs> Uh, and uh, there are, again, we've plotted, uh, they, uh, they have plotted rotational period against uh, stellar mass. And uh, the color symbols shows if a magnetic field, so this is all information about magnetic fields, statistical information about the magnetic fields of these mapped stars. Um, the color shows us if a magnetic field is more poloidal or toroidal, the dominant component is more polar-like or toroidal-like. The shape of the symbol tells us how axisymmetric or non-axisymmetric the magnetic field is, so if it's simple or complex, more or less. And the size of the symbol denotes the strength of the field. And if we again have a closer look, we see that for the fully convective M-dwarfs I was mentioning in the beginning already, uh, WXUMA for example here, uh, they are uh, quite quickly rotating and have very strong but very simple fields. So simple shapes, big symbols, more poloidal components, whereas for the more solar type stars, the higher masses, we have more complex fields and as they, are, they are rotating uh, more slowly and slowly. <coughs> um, they are getting, the fields are getting weaker and weaker and, and we see quite a, quite a nice evolution and quite a nice picture together with uh, stellar mass and rotational period. So we can get a statistical clue on how uh, stars are behaving in terms of magnetic fields. There are always exceptions, of course, I won't go into those now, but we have quite a good idea already how magnetic fields possibly evolve together with uh, age and with uh, stellar mass. So what can be done already in the end is based upon the maps I was showing you, doing uh, magnetic field extrapolations, wind modeling, and uh, put this into context of the plot I showed you before and find out if a star is really uh, 
fast rotate with a lot of X-ray output, try to cover this area in a very good statistical way and try to get as many boundary conditions as possible for our estimates. Uh, how different conditions uh, influence uh, planetary atmospheres in different ways. I'm telling you a little bit more on M dwarfs and their issues with habitability, non-habitability. They are one of the, the exciting subjects currently in terms of uh, search for habitable planets around them. And uh, just to mention some characteristics and to put them into context with solar type stars, uh, is uh, showing you this plot time again against LX to L ball and we have plot different tracks for different stellar masses 0.1 solar masses, 0.2 and so on, 0.3 up to one solar mass, the Sun should be around here and we see that in terms of X-ray level they are starting out with uh, quite comparable levels but uh, M dwarfs are, are the, especially the, the very late type M dwarfs, they are sta staying a lot more, they are staying at a higher X ray, at the big initially high X ray level for a much longer time, in contrary to solar type stars, where the uh, X ray activity level is going down uh, quite quickly with, uh, with time. Um, because I'm mentioning this also because from M dwarfs you might often have heard already or will hear in the future that they, they are said to be very active and have to have very high activity levels, which is actually not true. They don't have higher levels than solar type stars. They start at the same levels, but they stay active for a much longer time, which likely can cause a very harsh environment for planets around them. So, uh, even if we have another look uh, at another wavelength area uh, in uh, the near UV, even there the most active uh, uh, M dwarfs like Edilio in this case, uh, they show lower near UV in their habitable zones and only in the far UV they are getting the most active M, M dwarfs are getting more luminous than the sun. So, so here the activity level is not really higher uh, than for solar type stars, but it's uh, staying up quite a bit longer. Uh, in terms of flare numbers, flare important, uh, flares important uh, indicate or important uh, triggers or important effects to consider when talking about habitability. Um, if we have a look at the flare rates compared, uh, comparing solar type stars, again, Ikedra, a very young solar type star, Ebidor, a little less active, Edileo, Cn Leo, going towards M dwarfs, Kappa Wanseti with increasing age, you see that for the young solar type star, if we have a look at the XUV flare rate above a given threshold, uh, it decreases a lot, like say from 10 to 3 to 0.6 and 0.01, with decreasing mass, so solar type to M dwarfs, and uh, the overall emission decreases quite a bit as well. And also with age, we have a decrease of uh, flare rate from 10 to 0.2 for a given threshold per day, for example. So solar type stars are, young solar type stars in particular, are flaring more than uh, M dwarfs. But what might be an, an effect that, is, that could be important when talking about habit habitability is that the contrast between the flares on an M dwarf surface, the stars are much smaller, uh, so in relation the flares might, uh, they stand out more, they show a higher rel relative amplitude if you compare them to solar type stars, that might be, have an important consequence for atmospheric photochemistry or life on planets around these stars. So this different relation in flare signatures might be important if we compare solar type stars and M dwarfs habitability. We should take that into account. So another, another issue with M dwarfs is that if we ask ourselves what are the best host stars is that they have a very long uh, premium sequence evolution, the luminosity decline for, for G stars is much flatter. Uh, what you see here is a plot, again, stellar age against stellar luminosity 
for F stars, uh, G, F, another F5 star sun, K5, M1, M5, and M8. So uh, decreasing uh, temperature and masses. And you see that the luminosity evolution with age for F stars and solar type stars is quite flat. So there's a decrease, a slight increase again, and, but it's more or less flat. So a planet around a solar type star is facing very comparable conditions throughout uh, its lifetime in terms of luminosity. Not in X-rays, not in other activity signatures, but luminosity is not changing so much. Which is not at all the case for M dwarfs. So if you have a look at the M dwarfs around M8, M8 for example, or M5 already, you see a steep luminosity decline and then it's getting flat a lot later, which also means that the uh, habitable zone is shrinking. You don't see it very well here. That's the circle, that's another one. And the star in the center is the star. And this is the habitable zone extent around the young M dwarf. And later on at this age, you have the habitable, habitable zone with decreasing luminosity much further in. So the zone where water can be liquid on the surface of a planet around this star. So there is really a shrinking habitable zone around M dwarfs. And I personally would not be able to figure out if systems could exist that uh, where a habitable surface survives out here survives as long as uh, or a planet here in here can survive as long as uh, it get, it's getting into the habit habitable zone together with the stellar evolution later on. So this is a really a time scale issue that is not solved yet and the host star in principle should stabilize before the, before the ocean crust formation. We do not know at all if this is possible or not in such uh, systems and such configurations. So in contrary to T stars, we are confronted here with uh, changing extent or changing positions of the habitable zone with the lifetime of the star. Um, so again, showing you the plot from before, including M dwarfs, uh, age, LX to L ball. Uh, so X-ray level with slow rotators, intermediate and fast rotators. And if we compare that to a similar figure that is uh, denoting M dwarfs, we see again that M dwarfs are staying at higher activity levels for much longer than decline. They decline very steeply. And we just don't know at all how this high magnetic activity level uh, during the first billion years affects a planetary atmosphere, if it can stay livable or not or if, if it can evolve later, it's just, it sounds unlikely to me. And, and we don't know how these harsh conditions really affect uh, uh, the stars, in the, uh, the planets around them in the end and the atmospheres. So the strong flares, coronal mass ejections and, and everything that's going on on the stellar surface we mentioned already is affecting uh, the planets on a much closer orbit. So this is also something uh, we need to consider that the signatures are not stronger than for solar type stars, but the planet is much closer in, which certainly has an effect. Um, also in terms of magnetic fields, I mentioned already in the beginning, M dwarfs, and I'm going into more detail here now, M dwarfs can have very different uh, 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 configurations. When we're going to the very cool low mass M dwarfs, we have we can have magnetic fields up to 6.4 kilogauss, which is a lot more than for solar type stars, dipolar configurations, activity underneath. And these might of course also cause very harsh for planets uh, around their atmospheres. And this is again another plot to show you how different magnetic field signatures for M dwarfs can be. On the top you see DT Virgin is an early M dwarf, still having a radiative core. If you remember the slides from the beginning, having more solar type magnetic fields with a tachocline alpha omega dynamo, rather weak and complex magnetic field. And as we are getting to later M dwarfs, TJ51 for example, uh, we again see these are positive magnetic field component, uh, negative positive magnetic field components. The, the fields are getting quite a bit stronger, up to 1.6 kilogauss in this case, or up to 5 kilogauss, changing a lot with time as well, um, and, and being much more simple but much stronger. And I think we can all imagine that conditions around such type of stars are very different from 
conditions around uh, solar type stars. Uh, this is again a comparable diagram, just to shortly show you, only for M dwarfs. So again, very strong fields, simple geometries, uh, but at the same time exceptions, weaker fields with stars of sim similar configuration, similar mass and similar rotation periods. It's not clear yet why this is uh, going on, what the uh, mechanism behind that could be, but just not to forget about it and to mention, we do not understand magnetic fields fully yet. <laughs> it will t still take some time. Uh, another effect, a very interesting study I wanted to mention that was done by one of our postdocs in our group as well, Kristina Kislyakova, is uh, the strong magnetic fields that could also cause induction heating in planets around them. So imagine there is a star with a quite a strong magnetic field, simple configuration, uh, planets are surrounding it in quite close in, in the habitable zone, and uh, the planet is then still within the uh, the magnetic field of the star, more or less. And uh, this magnetic field can cause or can induce then additional heating in the planet, which will make it difficult to let the crust solidify, which is of course very important to get a habitable planet. And uh, it can also lead to increased volcanic activity and even to magma oceans in some extreme cases. So it is possible, according to studies, that uh, the surface of such a planet around the M dwarf with a strong magnetic field can maybe never uh, solidify in the end. So, to finalize, facts and questions to address and maybe to, to give you along the way some things I thought I would like to summarize and mention is that uh, STARS, the stellar engine, is the driver of planetary environments in terms of uh, how the planetary atmosphere is eroding. I hope I got this message through that the star in the center of the evolution and the coevolution with the planetary system is really important when we talk about habitability. The rotational evolution together with the magnetic field evolution and activity evolution uh, matters a lot. And if you want to understand habitability of a planet, we need to understand the coevolution of the whole system. If we compare solar type stars, habitability around solar type stars and M dwarfs, they have comparable activity levels, but M dwarfs are active for a much longer time. The flare contrast in M dwarfs might be important though. So in relation, the flares are standing out more for a planet surrounding an M dwarf. And it is not clear at all how this affects uh, the photochemistry of an atmosphere. Uh, then we can of course ask the question if fast rotating stars offer better conditions for planets in the habitable zones or uh, for example if planets, but that's discussions that will come on in, will be in later talks as well. Uh, if it might be important that fast rotating stars uh, uh, can erode mass massive hydrogen envelopes more quickly or in a better way might be necessary for super Earth planets like, uh, for example, uh, so that the secondary atmosphere can evolve on the planetary surface. So we just don't know yet if it's necessary to have a fast rotating star in the beginning, an intermediate or a slow rotator uh, in the end. There are hints already, there are studies ongoing, but we don't know really yet what condition is the best one to produce a habitable system. And it might also be that there are a lot of different parameter combinations like fast rotation, a bigger planet, whatever, uh, that could make it possible to make an environment around a star habitable or not. And we still don't know yet if, our, uh, if the system like the Earth, the Sun and the Earth system is unique or if we have different, many different possibilities, grids where habitable planets can uh, develop. So we don't know yet, but I'm very confident that, that we'll find out in the next years, next decades, hopefully, I'm quite sure, within your science lifetime, <laughs> as you're all very young still, uh, most of you. So we don't know yet, but I think we will find that out in the near future, also with the help of you in the future studying astrophysics, astrobiology, whatever subject you choose in relation to uh, habitability of planets. Thank you.